In this video, I would like to discuss aspects of interpretation for the second movement of Bach's Concerto in D minor, BWV 974, which is a transcription for solo harpsichord of a concerto for oboe, strings, and basso continuo by Alessandro Marcello. The video will be structured as follows. First, you will see me perform the piece. Then I will discuss how I approached it, especially in terms of the type of expression I wanted to achieve. And finally, you will listen to the performance once more, but this time accompanied by the score. Let's start with the video performance.
My decision to perform this piece originated as a sort of challenge. One of my friends asked me whether it was possible, and I quote, to maintain the gentle, somber ethos that an oboe and strings can so easily achieve, end quote. Especially given all those repeated chords in the left hand. I had heard this transcription in the past, but was not overly familiar with it, although I do know Marcello's original concerto quite well, so the challenge was to see if this type of expression was possible to achieve on the harpsichord. And since I hadn't listened to Bach's transcription in quite a long time, it was a good opportunity to avoid listening to any recordings so that I would not be influenced by anyone else's approach. Let's begin with some background information. Bach made several harpsichord transcriptions of concertos by various composers. The transcriptions date from around 1714, while he was living in Weimar. Interestingly enough, Bach's transcription of the Marcello Oboe Concerto is earlier than the first printed edition of Marcello's original, which was published in 1717. So Bach must have been working from a manuscript version that is now lost. The influence of Italian composers on Bach's harpsichord music extends beyond these transcriptions. Not only are some of the preludes of the English suites structured according to ritornello form, to mention one obvious example, but Bach even published in the second volume of his Klavier Übung a three-movement composition that he titled Concerto nach Italienischen Gusto, which nowadays is more commonly known by the more concise name of Italian Concerto. We can look to the Italian Concerto for clues on how to perform the Marcello transcription since Bach tended to be more explicit with directions or instructions in his published music. If I were to slightly generalize about this Italian concerto, I would say that Bach seems to have condensed all the parts we would find in a traditional orchestral Italian concerto so that they can be performed on a harpsichord. So in some respects, Bach's Italian concerto resembles a transcription just like the ones he had done in his youth, although in this case we're dealing with an imaginary original. This also means that the Italian concerto is idiomatically conceived for the harpsichord, and more specifically, as Bach makes clear in the title page, a two-manual harpsichord. The requirement of a two-manual harpsichord can be seen as a means of having more dynamic contrasts, but more crucially, it also provides a means of achieving an effect that is very characteristic of a traditional orchestral Italian concerto. That is, the alternation of sections played by the full ensemble versus sections played by the soloist, since each manual of the harpsichord has its own distinctive timbre. For the second movement of the Italian concerto, Bach indicates a dynamic of piano for the left hand and forte for the right hand. This implies that each hand should play on a separate manual. More specifically, the left hand should be on the upper manual, as the upper manual tends to have a slightly softer hue although not necessarily always in terms of volume, but rather in terms of timbre. But keep in mind that this depends very much on the particular instrument. My harpsichord is also softer in terms of volume, but that doesn't always have to be the case. In many respects, this movement and the one from the Marcello transcription have an identical texture. The right hand assumes the role of the soloist, while the left hand represents the ensemble accompanying the soloist. 
it therefore makes sense to also play the Marcello transcription using two manuals. While the texture may be similar, if we examine what the left hand plays in the two pieces, then we see that there is a fundamental difference. The Italian concerto consists of a moving line punctuated by bass notes, while the Marcello transcription consists entirely of repeated chords. And you have already heard the Marcello, but let me show you how the Italian concerto begins. And yes, I know I mentioned left hand, but when it's only the left hand and the right hand doesn't do anything, I actually use both of my hands because I can play more expressively that way. So I try to utilize that opportunity, especially since it's the beginning of the piece. While it is reminiscent of an actual Italian concerto, the type of accompaniment Bach has written for his Italian concerto is specifically conceived with the capabilities of the harpsichord in mind. The changes in gesture and register provide variety, and more crucially, the fact that we have a musical line that is constantly in motion means that Bach is exploiting the instrument's resonance and introduces more expressive possibilities, especially in terms of creating subtle dynamic effects. What Bach has done, in other words, is to create a type of accompaniment that not only resembles the accompaniment of a real Italian concerto, but is also perfectly idiomatic for the harpsichord. Parenthetical remark, if anyone is still hanging on to the old-fashioned idea that Bach was indifferent to instrumental sound and that his music is abstract and is all about form and structure, this is an excellent example of Bach himself refuting that idea. On the other hand, when Marcello was writing his concerto, he was thinking in terms of a very different set of instrumental capabilities and colors. And we have to face the fact that when making a transcription of any kind, something of the original is bound to get lost in the process. So to what extent can we preserve something of the expressive ethos of the original? I think there are two ways of going about this. The first is to figure out how to approximate the original. And the second is to use the capabilities of the harpsichord and introduce new expressive possibilities. Let me start by showing you what happens when we don't do anything and just play the chords. And if you remember how I played it when you watch the video, you will notice that there is a difference if I do nothing at all and just play the chords. So clearly it sounds quite clunky and if you remember my performance it didn't sound like this and again now I'm going to talk about some strategies that we can use so that it doesn't sound like that. Perhaps one obvious solution which I'm not going to employ is to use the lute stop. This is what that would sound like. Clearly, 
this softens up the chords. However, I'm not convinced this is the way to go. If I were to relate this to the original, it makes me think of strings playing pizzicato, which is not what actually happens. Also, once this more quiet sound has been set up, there are arguably more limited possibilities for dynamic gradations. Please keep in mind, though, that this is my personal view and that using the lute stop is a perfectly valid option. I just choose a different approach. So what interpretive strategies can we use? Let's start with the left hand. The first thing I would do right at the beginning is to separate the chords in groups of two in order to create a decrescendo and give a sense of direction. And what I mean by this is that instead of simply playing I do this and this is very difficult and I will explain in a minute why. And then I would slowly start breaking that pattern for the reason that I don't want it to start mimicking the right hand phrasing, which in some respects, in sorry, in some places, also uses this kind of, of two note phrasing. So at the beginning, it helps me to give a sense of direction, especially as the left hand is playing on its own. But then once the right hand comes in, I can kind of relax that and play things a little more evenly. The second thing I would do, and this is what I started doing and why when I first started doing this two note pattern, the, the note didn't speak, the second note didn't speak immediately, is because I would play as close to the keys as possible, not even lifting the keys all the way and plucking as slowly as possible. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm really staying as close to the keys as I can, but if you look at my hands, What happens here is that this can be very, very tricky because you risk the occasional note not sounding or sounding at a slightly wrong moment. To my mind, at least, expression is far more important than being note perfect. And I would rather risk a mistake and get the expression right than play it safe. But you can see that this is very, very difficult, especially if I'm trying to demonstrate and I'm trying to keep a clear view so that you can see what I'm doing. I've mentioned in previous videos that arpeggiating chords is a way of softening their impact. In this instance, however, since chords is all we have, I would use that effect extremely sparingly as it can easily sound like a mannerism. In addition, since the left hand is responsible for the rhythmic structure and coherence of the piece, I don't want the arpeggiations to diffuse the rhythm, except perhaps in a couple of moments of heightened expression. So I would use this very, very sparingly. The fourth type of strategy is that rather than play down the loudness of some of the thicker chords, I selectively emphasize that loudness in order to create dynamic variety. A great example occurs near the end of the piece, after the right hand has finished its solo and joins the left hand for the concluding measures. The chords are going to get progressively thicker for a while, and I'm going to emphasize that. In other words, here I want to create a gradual crescendo. Here 
now and papering off. So what I did there was actually to use these thick chords to my advantage. I created a crescendo and then as the chords are getting less thick, I was able to taper off the sound all the way to the end. Now if we look at the right hand, I would say that here we have more potential for lyricism. So I would say that a flexible sense of rhythm is extremely important and the right hand can dance around the beats while the left hand maintains a more steady beat. I also try to not make anything sound rushed and this also goes for the ornaments which I mostly try to play fairly slowly or as I sometimes like to describe it, play them a little lazily. And what I mean by this is that if we look at the beginning of the right hand line, and we have that ornament there, I would play this as lazily and as slowly as I could. And it sounds really nice if you put it together with the left hand. And again. I did it a little faster this time because I want to provide variety. And again, a little more slowly, but all of these ornaments are played slowly, are played lazily in a, in a very relaxed manner as much as possible. And again, I try to provide variety within that framework, but the idea here is that nothing should really stick out. We want everything to be very lyrical and very soft rather than kind of punchy and sudden. So this is a kind of strategy that I would follow a lot with the ornamentation of the right hand. So now follows the performance again, this time accompanied by the score. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.